Welcome to a very special uh, <laughs> Dragon Plus live stream. I very am special your host, uh, uh, Bart Carroll, and uh, joining me remotely as well, Jeremy Crawford, the lead designer of the Player's Handbook and lead rules designer of Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome, Jeremy. How are you doing? Hi there. <laughs> I'm all right. I've been spending a lot of time in this room for the last few weeks. <laughs> and I've, I've been in so many uh, online meetings and s seeing uh, little windows with these books behind me, I'm starting to think I, I only exist in this little box that you can now see me in. <laughs> uh, no, we, we have not sold to Jeremy in a box as a product yet, but... Uh, <laughs> Handy for, for game tables. So uh, obviously uh, we are not back in the office at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, a, a quick shout out to everyone uh, to continue to to please be safe, stay uh, safe. A play shout safe out to everyone. At home. Uh, we are back up and running with live streams as best we can on the uh, Dungeons and Dragons channel. I know Shelly and Greg have been running. Uh, Dragon Talk for the last few weeks on Fridays. I believe Kate Welch has been up and running uh, with Welch's Game Juice. So this this was the show that uh, I think was last on the official list. Uh, we've had a, a couple of weeks of technical hurdles to overcome, uh, but we're back. We're back, baby. We're back <laughs> as, as best we can be. And next week, uh, hopefully we will have a... Uh, uh, a better microphone for myself. So apologies in advance if my audio is not coming in as clearly as I would like, but uh, we want to talk with Jeremy anyways. So uh, <laughs> uh, so why don't we, uh, we jump in into a few things here. Uh, Jeremy, with, um, with uh, this, the play at home mandates, uh, any, any things that you have been doing lately for playing Dungeons and Dragons or other games at home? I, I have been playing D&D at home. Uh, we've been doing a weekly game. And in fact, we've been playing D&D more often while in quarantine uh, than we normally do, partly because all the other things that we would often be doing uh, have been canceled. <laughs> and so... <laughs> The, I guess the, the the faint silver lining has been more time for D&D. So yeah, we've been we've been playing some remote games. I've uh, also dipped my toe into the Final Fantasy VII remake. Uh, uh, yeah, have you have you tried it out? I have not. Uh, the video or sorry, the digital game I would say that I've been playing the most lately. Of all things, my six-year-old son has taught me how to play Fortnite, finally. So <laughs> we have been doing a lot of Fortnite play, which uh, it turns out to be kind of a, a fun way to spend time with, uh, with your kid. We go in there together as teammates and hunt down everyone else that we can. So. Oh, see, I, I was imagining uh, you two were going in and just doing the dance emotes the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that as well uh that as well and he is learning to to carry the dance emotes from the digital realm to the real realm so oh he's a better flosser than i am although uh only in the dance sense i am still a far superior flosser in the more traditional dental sense <laughs> i i need to become a better flosser of both types <laughs> <laughs> so i was uh i've asked you we've, we've gone on uh, video chats before but not publicly but tell me about your home office what are we looking at behind you uh lots of books um lots of D, &D books in particular in fact uh you can't actually see the top shelf of this bookcase but it has uh books in it from every edition of D, &D. Uh, I also have books over there from uh, my past uh, academic life as a student of philosophy and theology. There are some D&D uh, stuffies over there from Gamehole Con. I think you can see a little mimic, maybe the owl bear. Oh, there's a bullet oh, yeah. lurking down there as well. A little uh, audio. 
Yeah, yeah. I've actually done a, a lot of D and D writing over the years in this room. Ah, nice. I, speaking of Game Hold Con, I was online playing with Alex Cammer yesterday. Oh, uh, fun! A little bit of gaming, yes. So, <laughs> was... and were you guys playing D and D? We were, we were playing of all things Boot Hill. Wow. I, yes. Uh, <laughs> that is a blast of the past. It is. I, it was one of those games that I had never played, but as a uh, voracious reader of the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide as a kid, I remember seeing the references to converting your Boot Hill and Gamma World characters into Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, oh, what the hell is this all about? Well, and the Boot Hill and Gamma World stuff being in the original Dungeon Master's Guide is partly why we made sure to include firearm rules in the fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide. That was actually a tip of the hat uh, to that section in the first edition DMG. Ah, nice. There, there you go. Uh, so uh, otherwise, any, um, any uh, you've been playing Final Fantasy VII, uh, but any uh, shows you've been um, streaming or uh, binging lately? So we, we have, for a number of months, have tried to not binge shows. We, if we really like a show, we actually like to stretch it out and you know, allow ourselves only one episode or two at a time. We broke that rule this past week uh, for Picard, the new Star Trek series. We ended up binging it over the weekend. Uh, and if, <laughs> if, have, have you seen it yet? I have not. I am not a subscriber. Uh, is it? It's, it's CBS streaming, right? But it's, uh, it's 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 free right now. Okay. All right. Yep. And I was a big fan of Star Trek: The Next Generation, and I really enjoyed Picard. But right. I won't say anything else because I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> uh, have you been uh, as as most of the country dabbled in Tiger King on Netflix as well? No. No, that, it, that one we binged like crazy here. Uh, so uh, generally, it, it we are not fans of sh of any kind of show where weird or harmful things are done to animals. Uh, Don't watch Tiger King. Yep, <laughs> I, I we we saw the trailer for it, and and there there was an immediate and emphatic nope in our yeah. household. <laughs> yes, uh, it. Yes, I, it tells a, I, I guess, compelling story is, is an accurate statement, but uh, uh, a hard uh, trigger warning for animal cruelty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but on a lighter note, uh, we've also been getting into Schitt's Creek, which we had never seen before with Eugene Levy and family. So I, I am, I'm on the second to last season of that, and I love it. It's so it stays uh, pretty good all the way through. Oh, I think it get, actually gets better and better uh, as oh. it goes along. So, so I highly recommend sticking with it. It <laughs> it remains it remains funny, but then also starts uh, having quite a bit of heart. Uh, so, there are actually some later episodes where I found myself uh, surprisingly moved by what was going on in the story. All right. Yeah. No. It's it's just it's interesting for me to see Eugene Levy as sort of the stately patriarch of the family where, you know, I grew up with him as the goofball in the eighties comedies, yeah, you know, yeah. so this is a strange turn for him, but uh, yeah, the eyebrows cannot be denied. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, so uh, why don't we pivot to what we actually want to discuss today, because we do have uh, quite a bit of official material that we do want to discuss today. We haven't had a chance uh, to get back on the live stream. There have been not uh, one, but two unearthed arcanas that have dropped in recent weeks. So uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the Unearthed Arcana material, uh, and I believe we're going to be starting with the Spells and Magic Tattoos material that dropped way back on March 26th. Exactly right. And I do want to say, before we dive in, uh, 
you were wise to move quickly past the Final Fantasy VII remake because I could go on and on about how much I like it. <laughs> and then no, no. People, people who tuned in to hear about Unearthed Arcana will be like, oh my gosh, Jeremy I would just not stop talking about Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> I have very distinct blind spots in my uh, geek wheelhouse. And I have to admit, here's two. I did not see any Rick and Morty until this year and then devoured them. I have not played any of the Final Fantasy games. Oh my so goodness. I did not ask out of my own ignorance of the series. Well, this would be a great one to uh, try out and get your first taste. Uh, for many people, uh, seven of, and here I'm talking about the original one was their favorite Final Fantasy game. But again, let's not go too deep because I'm actually a Final <laughs> Fantasy fan. So I could start talking about Final Fantasy 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13. I've From 7 on, I've played uh, each one. So. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. Let me give, a, let me give a, uh, a, a taste of that on my own time, and then I'll come back with uh, specific questions. All right. Sounds good. But All right, so, uh, going... Uh, so on our third... Arcana, Spells and Magic Tattoos. What shall we say about this Unearthed Arcana generally? And then we'll dive a bit into it specifically. So the theme really of the Spells and Magic Tattoos Unearthed Arcana was uh, sort of magical miscellany. We had a variety of magical things that uh, we have been uh, experimenting with. Uh, some of them, you know, sort of functional things we wanted to explore in the game's rules, like the summoning spells here, and then some others, which in many ways are really just for fun. I think of uh, the Magic Tattoos being in the kind of just for fun category. Uh, and then we, in the process, also added in a few other spells, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Acid Stream and the Otherworldly Form, uh, because again, we had some effects we wanted to get out there for people to test. So the biggie when it comes to the spells uh, are those summoning spells I mentioned. The game, uh, of course, already has a number of summoning spells. There are some in the player's handbook. There are also some in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. But I have mentioned, uh, I believe, uh, in this show with you, Bart, before, that in addition to exploring certain subclasses that have companion creatures and putting the companion creatures stat blocks right in the subclass features, we also wanted to explore that approach with summoning spells. And in fact, it was an approach that we uh, were very interested in all the way back when we were writing the fifth edition player's handbook. And now we, th we, we felt, especially given the positive response to the stat blocks being embedded in the subclasses, now is a time where we could explore embedding the, the stat block of a summoned creature in the summoning spell. Now, someone watching might be wondering, well, Jeremy, why, what's the big deal? Why, why do you want to do that? A big part of it is about making summoning, summoning easier at the game table because a lot of summoning spells, you cast them and then they'll say, now go pick a creature of a certain type uh, with one of the following challenge ratings, which unless you've done your homework before the session, suddenly results in a person having to rifle through the monster manual, Volo's Guide to Monsters, Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, and any other source of monsters you might have to find just the right monster for the occasion. Right. So the unwritten uh, disclaimer is everyone else take a bathroom break now. Right. Right. Unless, again, uh, uh, you know, the person came prepared or they rely on the DM to choose because also the player's handbook summoning spells in particular basically allow the player to express an intention for what they summon. And then the DM decides if the intended creature actually appears or if something appears in its stead. Uh, you know, in which case the DM might just have a few stat blocks at hand and use those whenever that, that player's character casts those spells. We wanted to create some summoning spells with 
much more certain summonables. Like you know what you're getting. You don't have to go shopping in a monster book. Uh, and, but you also have a little bit of customizability. So we built into each of these uh, monster stat blocks, the ability for the summoner to make some choices. And here we not only wanted to cover the different types of creatures that you might want to summon, but also give you different abilities that will be useful in different situations. So you'll see when you look at the, you know, the aberrant spirit, the fiend, the beast, the celestial, etc., many of them have different abilities that will be advantageous in different adventuring situations. Some of them are very obvious uh, or, or very tactical. For instance, if you look at the celestial that you can summon, really you're making a choice between, do you want a, an angelic being that is a ranged attacker primarily, or one who is a melee attacker primarily? Uh, when it comes to summoning a bestial spirit, uh, you're deciding uh, if it's you know, something that's going to fly or be amphibious or uh, you know, be at home on land. You have a number of fun choices, which then feed into what this creature looks like. Because another thing that's special about these summoning spells versus our other summoning spells is in each case here, you are calling forth a spirit that takes on a particular form whenever you summon it. And so here the narrative is a bit different from the other summoning spells. Many of them actually involve um, either spirits taking on particular forms or the, the transport of an actual creature from somewhere else in the multiverse to wherever the spellcaster is currently. Right. Here, we're, here we're very explicit. You are calling forth this spirit and giving it physical form. This is important partly to explain the narrative of how you know it can it can have different capabilities each time you summon it. Uh, but we also wanted to give people the ability to customize how it looks. You're not entirely bound by the abilities or the appearance of the creatures in the monster manual or Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes or another monster book. You get to decide what kind of critter you just summoned with summon bestial spirit. And so really it makes it very open-ended for you and gives you uh, several you know, knobs you can turn to get just the creature you want. The other biggie here uh, that is a big boon to summoners, and, and by summoners I mean any character who is into summoning and played by somebody who enjoys the story of playing a character who calls forth creatures to help them mm -hmm. is unlike most of our summoning spells, these take only an action to cast. Most of our summoning spells take a minute or more to cast, meaning most of them need to be cast outside combat. These you can do on the spot, right in the middle of a battle. And we were able to be generous with that because of building the stat block into the spell. Because since we know as designers, the range of possibility for each of these spells in terms of the creature that's going to show up, then we can confidently allow you to do that quickly with an action. One of the reasons why the other spells take so long to cast is partly a playtime issue. It's because of that rifling through the monster manual thing. We don't want combat to come screeching to a halt as, you know, Gladys the Warlock or Harry the Wizard is, you know, okay, let me figure out what CR2 fey creature I'm going to summon right now. Right. Uh, that in, in the player's handbook summoning spells, that's mostly going to happen uh, outside combat. Yes, it's, it's very Presto the Magician trying to root around inside of his hat and figuring out, it's like, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. I, I've got something in here, hold on. Uh, I, love, I, I love that analogy, especially since the DM does have the option of having something else show up because so often Presto does not pull out what he wanted to pull out. Oh, oh invariably never exactly what he wants. <laughs> and maybe it's helpful uh, yeah. in some circumstances. Uh, really quickly, I'll mention uh, we've been putting up uh, some of the pages that you're referencing on the screen as we've been discussing. Um, 
uh, you can, for, for folks that don't already have it, of course, download uh, the Spells and Magic Tattoos PDF uh, from the Unearthed Arcana uh, archive. Uh, and again, as we are discussing, if you do have any questions, and I do see them starting to come in now, please do put them into chat. Please do preface them with questions as uh, we've stated before, and we, we haven't done this in a while. Uh, so thank you for your questions. Uh, if we don't get the, to them today, we do compile them and uh, make a, a good effort to try and come back to as many as we can address in uh, future discussions. So in, in this article I mentioned before, we also have a few other uh, spells which are kind of uh, standalone effects we wanted to explore, Acid Stream, Otherworldly Forms, Spirit Shroud. These are all just some fun new potential tools for our spellcasting classes. And for uh, those of you listening, uh, we don't just wait for uh, the survey to come back in to read feedback. We are also looking on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Reddit, and elsewhere. And we have heard you, those of you who have begged for artificers to also get acid stream. <laughs> uh, so there, uh, we we look at we look at all of that feedback, and uh, we whenever a spell makes it over the initial hurdle of getting a high enough satisfaction rating to be considered for official inclusion in the game, we will definitely consider uh, which class lists all of these spells appear on with everyone's feedback in mind. The artificers get acid stream, but it's only citric acid. So it doesn't do much damage at all. That's, <laughs> that's the drawback. <laughs> I love, I, see now I want somebody to play the character where if acid stream makes it into the game, uh, where yeah, theirs is always this big blast of orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very presto, you know, magician version of Acid Stream, where there's just a big lemon that gets squeezed out of his hat. Like, this is not yeah. what I asked for. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so uh, the other thing I'll point out is each of the summoning spells, going back to those, has some kind of flavorful material component that the spellcaster must have to cast these spells. I'm, I'm not only am pointing this out because we often enjoy putting interesting world flavor into uh, the material component note area in a spell, but I also wanna remind people that in fifth edition, material components are not consumed by a spell unless the spell specifically tells you it is. I say this because often people will see components, especially costly ones like these, that you know, yeah. some of them are 400 gold pieces, uh, 500 gold pieces. These are not consumed by the spell. Think of this as a focus for the summoner's summoning power. And once they have it, they can use it over and over and over again. Uh, but if they lose it, well, then they're gonna need to do some work uh, to either get it back or find a new one. From a storytelling perspective though, now I'm thinking as a thief or a rogue, either in the party or as an NPC, if I see somebody casting one of these spells, I might know enough to think they possess a pricey material component that I might then want to go after. Yeah, yeah, you might, like if, that, if, if you're up against somebody who keeps summoning these elemental spirits on you, it's like, hmm, somewhere on them, they probably have a crystal <laughs> vial worth 400 gold pieces or more. <laughs> let's, let's get it. Exactly. Yes. I'm, I'm looking at the material components now, the uh, celestial spirit. It's the $500 gold piece one. So I'm going for that uh, golden reliquary. <laughs> well, and who knows? That golden reliquary might belong in a museum. You know, it could turn out this is this is could be a press, precious historical object that right, the spellcaster is using. Yes, I mean by definition, isn't that sort of a, the, the holder of a uh, relic or a saint's bone from could have been stolen from a church? Yes, <laughs> exactly. And that's <laughs> and that's what I mean when I say we often embed little bits of story in the material component line because. 
there could be a quest in your campaign simply to get a golden reliquary that you can use to summon celestial spirits. Uh, because because uh, you know you're not going to be able to walk into a typical general store and you know and go into their golden reliquary section <laughs> and <laughs> and walk out with one and hope you're there on one of their you know their clearance sale days and you know <laughs> and maybe spend less than 500 GP. No, you're yes. going to you're going to have to make this or find it. Oh. Is the place you got it from glad that you have it? Or do they have their own emissaries that they're sending out to perhaps reclaim it? Uh, so, yeah. I one, one thing I encourage uh, all of our DMs who are watching to, to ponder is when you're creating an adventure, look at your NPCs and look at your player characters in your campaign. If they're spellcasters, Take a look at the spells that they do cast and that you, you know they're going to eventually want to cast and see, are there some uh, interesting material and costly components uh, listed in the spells? And think about sprinkling those components amid the treasure of your adventures uh, because, because that can be a really fun experience where a person might get something like this like maybe a group you know finds an ancient temple and they find a golden reliquary in it and then a light bulb might go off for one of the characters later like wait a second i can use this thing to cast that summoning spell and you know and there there are many spells in the player's handbook as well that have costly material components that can be given out as treasure and sometimes the players will notice that they got you know, something that can be used for a spell and sometimes they won't. If they didn't notice it, maybe you need to put it in the treasure again or have an NPC pointed out. Uh, right. It, it also makes an excellent plot hook where if the party itself might not use this as a material component or need it as such, somebody else in the world might. So it might be worth $200 for the raw or gold pieces for the raw material. But if you find the spellcaster who does need it, it's worth 500 and it so happens they happen to have you know the next piece of the story plot uh, that the dungeon master would like to deliver to you yeah yeah absolutely shall we talk about tattoos all right so uh that is the yes that is the summoning spells but there is another uh aspect of this unearthed arcana which was the tattoos yeah and so uh uh, ben Petrosor is our designer on staff who did a bunch of work on the summoning spells. And then Dan Dillon did a bunch of work on the tattoos. And here we were wanting to explore tattoos as a kind of treasure, which is a fun little design challenge because we wanted you to be able to basically find a tattoo in a dragon's hoard, which of course in the real world is like the sentence I just uttered is nonsense because you, know, <laughs> you, you, you go and have you know, a tattoo inked onto your skin. Um, and so we wanted to create these magic items where the item turns into the tattoo. And then also another design goal for these was for the tattoo to essentially be transferable. That when a person's attunement ends to the tattoo, it turns back into this item, which then someone else can use uh, to place that magic tattoo upon themselves. Uh, quick question that had come in. Uh, Tittlebit had asked, uh, having multiple tattoos only counts as a single attuned magic item, which seems a bit generous, uh, perhaps. Is there a reason why it was not one tattoo equals one attuned item? So we wanted to explore giving people the ability to have essentially a growing collection of tattoos. And I don't have any tattoos myself, but everyone close to me in my life who has them they always seem to be like, once you get one, you want another one and then another one. And you start having this growing collection. Many of them will also often start blending in together. Uh, and so we, there's this idea that, you know, one, the, 
the two tattoos might actually turn into one tattoo uh, on your, you know, in terms of the art on your, on your skin. And we also aren't expecting people to find these tattoos everywhere. And so if you are fortunate enough to get a bunch of them, yeah, it's pretty darn generous. But again, this is why it's an unearthed arcana and not in a book. We want to hear people's feedback. If DMs are terrified at the idea of a person essentially getting three magic items for the price of one attunement, let us know. Uh, right. that, that, that is something that is very easy for us to modify. Uh, but again, and, and part, again. Oh, sorry. Uh, part, part of it is, is again, us uh, exploring the storytelling uh, that arises from tattoos. Because again, so often when a person gets a second tattoo, it's really just an extension of a tattoo they already have. Right. I, and I will say, I, I, again, as we've mentioned for, for previous Unearthed Arcanas, uh, I, again, it's uh, important for us to get the material out into the world, but as, as important to get the feedback uh, back from the world. So uh, if you do have feedback for uh, spells and magic tattoos, we do have that survey up now in the most recent Unearthed Arcana uh, for the uh, further psionic options. Uh, so if, if uh, you do have the time, please do let us know what you think of the material. The surveys are an important mechanism for, uh, for Jeremy and, and company to, uh, to, to hear back about uh, how it's going and uh, where it's working and where improvements might continue to be made. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the surveys are crucial. Uh, and we do de- we do a deep dive into all of the survey responses that we receive. And this is a great example too of how our our development process is is agile and also we're very responsive to feedback because if if we see uh, that this bit of mechanical generosity is not uh, singing for a lot of people, we could easily snip it out of all of these tattoos and no harm would be done to uh, the design that uh, we have presented. Uh, because really it's, it's, a, it's a cherry on top right now. Uh, these tattoos are gonna be great whether or not that bit of attunement generosity survives. So if you were gonna have a uh, tattoo yourself, uh, do you have a uh, candidate in mind? Now, do you mean one of these magic tattoos or a real tattoo? Could be, it could go either way. <laughs> I'll, fo- <laughs> I'll focus on the magic tattoos uh, here. So thankfully, I don't live in a world where there are real monsters to fight. I mean, there are <laughs> metaphorical monsters in our, in, in our world. Uh, so some of these ones that uh, are, you know, oriented toward battle, I would not have a whole lot of use for. So... I would probably like the Illuminator's tattoo to be able to write anywhere with my finger <laughs> and to make, make it, be handy. Ink, to make uh, ink invisible. Or especially the older I get, it would be nice to have the Life Well tattoo with its death ward. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, in case I get hit by a car, well, that tattoo then suddenly will save my life. Yeah, the Illuminator's tattoo, uh, there's options now for it. Uh, we're teaching Quinn here. We're, we're homeschooling him in these days. And it's just like... I, I'm trying to explain something to you and I don't have like a whiteboard, you know, I, if I could just draw it in the air, this would be, yep. this would make so much more sense. Yeah. <laughs> the, the masquerade tattoo would also be fun uh, because you can use it to cast the disguise self spell. Uh, and that would certainly make it much faster to get ready in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yes, on that note, uh, a question came in from Dungeon Scribe asking if uh, either one of us has attempted or undergone a homemade isolation haircut yet. Uh, I have not. My husband has been saying he really wants me to cut his hair, and I have been dragging my feet because I am 
basically terrified of being responsible for butchering his hair. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Mayofsky in the background is pointing to himself as uh, a recipient of a homemade uh, haircut. So. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone Thank so far as trimming the edges, but uh, it's it's get, it's getting up there. Yeah, it's, mine too. Yeah. I, I need thankfully I thankfully had a haircut right before the quarantine, and it just yeah. not because of any foresight on my part. It just happened to I happened to schedule it right before we all were you know told to stay home. Uh, but yeah, pretty soon I'm going to need to start trimming as well. <laughs> I've threatened to cut my son's hair, but I've I've done that badly once in the past, and I am currently forbidden. Um, so, <laughs> see again, if we had the masquerade tattoo, we wouldn't have to worry about this because we could just dis uh, all use right. disguise so, uh, self to make our bad hair go away. What, Bart? You froze. And I'm glad you froze smiling. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if everyone, if Bart unfreezes, he needs to succeed on his saving throw against whole person. I don't know if he's going to make it back to us. So uh, while we wait for Bart to come back, uh, I just wanted to reiterate uh, what he brought up earlier. Please do fill out the survey on spells and magic tattoos. Uh, we, we will dig into all of that and let us know what do you think about the extra attunement? Do you like this new approach to summoning? Are you one of those people who'd love for artificers to get acid stream? What do you think of otherworldly form and the other new options? And now Bart, I think you're back. I'm just speaking of summoning. Yes. Speak of, speak of the, no, I knew this was going to happen. I, <laughs> the, the home internet, I mean, of all the, you know, of all the problems, this is one of the, you know, the least um, impactful in a meaningful way. But uh, from a work perspective, the home internet, oh, you're so dependent on a good internet connection. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Shall we? Shall we move on to this week's Unearthed Arcana? Yes, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left on the clocks and we haven't even uh, mentioned, yes. So let's move over. So this was the Unearthed Arcana that dropped yesterday. So if folks haven't seen it yet, you can go right to the Dungeons and Dragons website. Um, I, I will mention the uh, um, for uh, the, the playing at home and, and staying safe and playing safe, Go to the front page of the Dungeons and Dragons website. We've got front and center the uh, link to resources and materials, many of which are free for folks that are interested in continuing to play at home, uh, continuing to play remotely and safely. Uh, there's been a, an ongoing series of um, DMs Guild and Adventures League uh, coloring pages we've been collecting and, and putting up uh, for folks to be able to download, including uh, even the starter set uh, rule book, um, which I was I was very excited to, uh, to, to be able to, to see that uh, go up. Um, so we'll continue to be putting out material uh, in, in that way in the coming days. So I heartily encourage folks to take advantage of it. Um, but uh, a long-winded way of saying also on the D&D website right now, is the most recent Unearthed Arcana. Uh, you can find out, you find the psionic options revisited, download the PDF, and as mentioned before, uh, please consider taking the survey for the most recent um, Unearthed Arcana as well for spells and magic tattoo right there. So, psionic options revisited. Uh, again, what shall we say generally, and then diving into it a bit specifically. So over the, the past few months, we have been in Unearthed Arcana releasing a whole bunch of different subclass options for every class in the game. And many of them have delved into different styles of magic, different combat methods, etc. Among that sweep 
of subclass options, we've included several that have delved into psionic power. And we recently were able to go through all of the feedback we got from previous surveys. So again, thanks to everyone who gave us your feedback. And after reading that feedback, I decided I wanted us to revisit all of the psionic options and to revisit them together. Uh, partly because one of the bits of feedback that we got was as much as people really liked most of what we had presented, because I'll, I'll lead with that, that the satisfaction scores were solid, uh, for basically from solid to really, really good on most of the psionic material that we had released before. Yet there was this recurring theme of people really wanting to see a bit more of a common thread among those options so that they mechanically had some similarities with each other so that they would feel like whether they were playing, you know, the fighter option, the rogue option, the sorcerer option, or what have you, that there would be something there that each of these psionic theme subclasses would have in common. We also had released some psionic themed spells as well as a couple of uh, psionic themed feats, and we wanted to uh, do some more of those feats. So all of that led to yesterday's Unearthed Arcana, where we returned to the subclass previously known as the Psychic Warrior. Now it's going by the name Cyanite. Uh, we returned to the Soul Knife. And we return to the aberrant mind sorcerer, but now called to the psionic soul. Uh, we also uh, revisit uh, three spells, two feats, and then introduce three more feats. In the same UA, we also make it clear that for now we have set aside the psionics wizard that we released before. The reason for that, if any of you are wondering, is it simply didn't hit the bar when it comes to satisfaction scores. As I've mentioned before on the show, we're always looking for things to land when it comes to overall satisfaction around 70% of the people who are surveyed liking the thing. And unfortunately, the Psionics Wizard scored well below that, as did most of its features. So actually, in fact, all of its features. So after looking at it, we always, of course, could redesign something. But for us, design time is a limited resource. And one of the decisions that uh, falls on me often as the lead rules designer is having to decide when it's time to set something aside. Because the audience basically is telling us not enough of us want it. Uh, and so that's really what happened with the psionics wizard. Now that said, some of that subclasses elements then migrated to other parts of, of the material we're exploring, which you'll see here. And also some piece of, pieces of it are likely to return in some future work that we might uh, present in Unearthed Arcana. And that's a, another way of saying something I've also said before, and that is whenever possible, we repurpose a design. Uh, so it, it, things basically uh, rarely stay dead forever. Uh, they, they, they often in our work uh, will come back. Uh, they might come back with a completely different name. Uh, they might come back in a completely different form. You know, it might've been a class feature before and now it's a spell was a spell before and now it's been split up into several class features or it's been turned into a feat or it morphed into a monster. Many of these things reincarnate uh, in, in our design. Uh, we also uh, ended up setting aside a number of the spells we'd explored before. Uh, the satisfaction scores on them were fine, but we weren't seeing a whole lot of enthusiasm for them. And we decided let's really zero in on what people were really grooving on uh, because we're always looking for, you know, what's bringing the bliss and let's make that stuff as good as we can make it. And so that led to uh, this, this Unearthed Arcana where we also uh, did announce that we have bid a fond farewell to the mystic uh, a Unearthed Arcana class that we explored back in 2017. And do you want me to say a little more about that or dive into the subclasses? 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking at chat if there is a... Uh, what they want. Uh, to talk more about the, the mystic or just to kind of go into what is... Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, the first couple, uh, yes, uh, a bit more on the mystic would be much appreciated. I believe. Okay, so in the article, and I encourage everyone watching to, to read the introduction of this article, because before you even get to the subclasses, there is this section called What is Psionic Power, where we talk a, about uh, psionic powers in editions past and how we have been exploring them in fifth edition going all the way back to the core books, uh, because psionics have, have been a kind of background element in d, &D uh, going all the way back to the first edition uh, Player's Handbook and Monster Manual. Mm -hmm. And that, that is why we do explore them, because they are a part of the d, &D multiverse. But as we point out uh, in this article, the way the game has explored those powers has varied tremendously from edition to edition. Uh, in first edition, those powers were options that a character might uh, be able to unlock within themselves. And But the neat thing is they were options that many different types of characters could gain access to, as well as some monsters could gain access to. So well, first, I very clearly remember rolling the percentile dice to see if your character had a chance to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to basically see, you know, did you happen to wake up one day and realize I can move things with my mind? I, uh, <laughs> I really just wanted the body weaponry power. <laughs> <laughs> um, then in, in uh, second edition, a psionic themed class was created. And that really was the first time psionics uh, became associated with a particular class. But in, in sort of the psionic vision that was in the original d, &D it was psionic power was not the domain of any particular class, uh, but of really anyone, uh, as long as they had that, that special X factor that meant you know, that such powers were unlocked within them. Now, that all said, with the mystic, we did explore taking a note from sort of the second edition approach, having a class dedicated to psionics, and that was the mystic. And there were a lot of people who were excited by the work that we did there, but also many, many people who expressed reservations about the complexity of the class, and it was complex. Uh, also, concerned about the class's balance. Uh, that, I should say, of the feedback is the one that is the least concerning to me because pretty much everything that goes out to playtest has balance issues. That's part of why we playtest. Uh, we tend not to do our final balance pass on designs until uh, it's time for us to finalize them for publication uh, because we, we really don't want to actually devote too much time getting the balance exactly right unless we're actually going to publish the thing. When it's still sort of in the, the lab and we're still poking at it and seeing, do we want to take this to the next step? We will often allow it to go out to play test with known balance uh, issues. So there, that was something that people brought up about the mystic, but again, that isn't the 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 reason for us saying farewell to it. Really, it was the complexity and then the biggie. This is really uh, the, the piece of feedback that was concerning and the piece of feedback actually that uh, I expected uh, when we first released the Mystic. And that is that the Mystic was too good at doing everything that every other class in the game does. Because really, the Mystic in a way was not so much a class, it was almost every other class reimagined as psionic, which is not how we design our classes normally. Now, this is on Arthurkana, which is meant to be a place of experimentation. And so we allowed ourselves to experiment. And the fear I had that we had created something that was too good at being everything was echoed back by the playtest feedback we got. And so if we were to ever return to a 
a psionic specific class, uh, it would need to have a much more focused identity and not be essentially, here is everything every other class does, but now with the psionic label on it. Uh, okay. it, need, it, it would need to have not just a thematic identity, but a functional identity. It would also need to be doing something that our other classes don't do. And that has also often been the struggle uh, that some fans have had over the years with psionic material is often when confronted with it, they'll look at it and then say, well, this is just what all the spells in the game do, but with the science fiction name put on it. Uh, and that is a legitimate concern. And so whenever now we attempt to create something that has a psionic theme in fifth edition, we want to make sure it, it has a, an identity of its own. Uh, that is both a thematic identity and a functional identity. And that then leads to why we ex were exploring in this most recent article, the psionic talent die. This idea of uh, characters who have psionic, innate psionic power, having this well of psionic energy that ebbs and flows as they use their power. And I've been seeing a lot of the questions have been coming in uh, about yeah a potential full psionic class, and uh, I think that is uh, addresses that. And 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 really, if people are wondering, are we going to do it? Uh, yes. The 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 answer straight up is we'll see. Uh, we'll see if basically the the future product design we do, as well as the stories we're telling, as well as the playtest feedback we get, makes it clear that there is a thematic and functional space that an entire class could occupy that isn't just what every other class does, but with an ESP style <laughs> aesthetic put on top of it. Uh, and I say this as somebody who loves uh, psionic material. Uh, it, and it's also important too, because sometimes the feedback we'll get is, well, it's impossible to have psionic material in D&D without a dedicated psionic class. Well, again, that's why it's important to remind everybody, psionic material in D&D didn't have a class until second edition. Psionic material in D&D was first introduced without any class associated with it, because that actually was part of the point. Part of the point in first edition D&D is that it was this amazing internal power that could pop up in anybody, uh, that it was not something that, that a particular class owned, uh, but was instead this mysterious energy that Bob the farmer or Clara the baker or Clarence the wizard might have suddenly manifested and they are able to do some, you know, strange thing with their mind that is not associated in any way actually with their class. And that that's one reason why here we wanted to explore having some more psionic feats because for a group that uh, uses feats, those feats are a way to really introduce that sort of first edition flavor of whatever your class is, your character might have, you know, woken up someday or, you know, you can imagine, you know, maybe it's since childhood, they had a strange sense uh, with their mind that, you know, burgeons into the ability to speak with people telepathically or move things with their mind. Uh, that is really what psionic uh, powers were all about uh, back when D&D first, you know, blazed into existence. So you're saying uh, being a Skywalker isn't a prerequisite to uh, having force powers. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Because, because in, uh, in first edition, any character, if you happen to be a human, I think human dwarf or halfling, uh, had a chance of, have, of manifesting psionic power. Uh, and and the, the way we're expressing that here is if you have feats, any character could just suddenly, I'm moving stuff with my mind. 
Uh, so uh, again, I know there's been a lot of questions uh, and comments that have been coming in. So uh, I'll, I'll just mention again, if we're not able to address your questions immediately now, uh, we are compiling them. Uh, we will be getting back to those in a future discussion. Uh, and as far as, as comments and feedback, uh, for the most recent Unearthed Arcana for the psionic options, we'll be getting that survey up uh, as, as soon as we're best able to. Uh, so please be patient and uh, we'll look to, to get that mechanism in place uh, for your feedback after you've had a chance to review and play through the most recent Unearthed Arcana material. And I guess next time we can dive into the nuts and bolts of the Sinite the soul knife and the psionic soul. Uh, so yes, let's do that. As we're getting close to two o'clock, uh, we'll schedule another opportunity where we can dive more into the psionic details, uh, answer some of your questions that you've raised uh, today, everyone. And of course, uh, more questions as they come in. So now that we're up and running, uh, we'll look to get back as best we can on our uh, usual live streaming schedule. Uh, so we appreciate everyone's patience with us. We appreciate everyone's uh, willingness to, to uh, consume uh, the live stream in a slightly different format uh, than the studio. Obviously, we wish we were back there and uh, someday, someday we will be, but for the time being, uh, uh, obviously, we're, we're all uh, being safe and uh, taking the recommended precautions of uh, working from home. Uh, so again, I would just like to reiterate to everyone uh, to, to stay safe yourself. Uh, we're putting up, again, daily options for, for uh, playing material. If that is of uh, any help or use to you, we hope that it is. Uh, and please do continue to tune in to the d, &D Twitch channel. Uh, we'll have our ongoing uh, streaming schedule up uh, from the folks from Wizards of the Coast and, and uh, other gaming groups and influencers as well. So we're glad to be able to, uh, to be back online, uh, even if we are doing so from the comforts of our home, which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing always. <laughs> Uh, so yes, until next time, I have some homework to ta uh, take a chance on Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's right. <laughs> uh, and we'll be talking with Jeremy again in the, uh, the coming weeks. Uh, so look for another Dragon Plus live stream. And we've got the Dragon Plus issue 31 will be coming out in a couple of weeks as well. We'll be talking with Jeremy in those pages, as well as uh, Wes, uh, regarding some other material that is coming down the line. I was just reviewing that today. Yeah, uh, I read it this morning seat. too. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Chapman sent that across. So uh, again, on, on behalf of the D&D team, uh, we're, we're glad to be back uh, streaming, but again, please do uh, be safe, stay safe, uh, and, and play safe. All right, Hi, until everyone. next time. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Sean and Pelham.